Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, March 19, 2024. A bipartisan agreement on the final six fiscal year 2024 federal spending bills, including the last holdout in the negotiations, Homeland Security Department, is announced by House Speaker Mike Johnson and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Friday is the deadline to get it passed and signed into law, prevent a partial government shutdown. With $60 billion in aid to Ukraine still stuck in Congress, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had a meeting in Germany of the 50-plus nations supporting Ukraine's war against Russia, says the United States will not let Ukraine fail, this coalition will not let Ukraine fail, and the free world will not let Ukraine fail. A House committee hearing today on the chaotic 2021 withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan with testimony from retired CENTCOM Commander General Frank McKenzie and retired Joint Chiefs of Staff Chair General Mark Milley. Pete Navarro reports to federal prison after being convicted of contempt of Congress for defying subpoenas for documents and testimony from the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. He's the first former aide to former President Donald Trump to serve time related to the efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. House debates a bill to keep data brokers from selling Americans' personal information to foreign adversaries. And today is C-SPAN's 45th anniversary. We'll hear from co-CEO Susan Swain about our Founders Day campaign. From ABC News, this story, President Joe Biden and congressional leaders announced Tuesday that they have reached an agreement on this fiscal year's final set of spending bills. Now the question is how fast lawmakers can get the bills passed to avoid a partial government shutdown. Well, President Biden said he'll sign the bill package as soon as he receives it. Time is running short. Legislative staff need time to finish the bill text, an arduous task. The House has a rule that lawmakers get 72 hours to review a bill before voting. And the Senate has never been known to, for its ability to sprint. Meanwhile, funding for several key agencies expires at midnight Friday. Work on the final spending bills hit a late snag around funding for the Department of Homeland Security. But the contours of that bill were resolved late Monday. Speaker Mike Johnson said the relevant committees are now drafting bill text to be considered by the full House and Senate as soon as possible. Democratic leader Akeem Jeffries issued a similar statement, saying in the next few days, upon completion of the drafting process, Congress would consider the package. That was reporting from ABC News. Senator Chuck Schumer talked about the spending package today on the Senate floor. Congress has less than a week to finish the job of fully funding the government for the remainder of the fiscal year. We all know it's been a difficult, drawn-out appropriations process for everyone in Congress. Appropriators in both chambers, their staffs, my staff and I, have kept at this for months. But today, we have good news. Earlier this morning, I announced that negotiators from both parties reached an agreement last night on the final six appropriations bills. We now have a bipartisan agreement for defense, financial services, homeland security, labor, HHS education, the ledge branch, and state and foreign ops. Senate and House appropriators are now working swiftly to turn this agreement into legislative text as soon as possible, so members can review, finalize, and ultimately take a vote in the coming days. Once the House sends us a funding package, I will put it on the floor of the Senate without delay. Now, it's a very good sign that we begin the week by announcing this agreement, but I want to be clear, there's a lot of work to do in the coming days. If both parties proceed in the same manner we did two weeks ago, quickly, constructively, and without unnecessary partisan dithering, then I'm hopeful we can finish the appropriations process without causing a lapse in government services. We haven't had a government shutdown since 2019, There's no good reason for us to have one this week now that we're getting very close to the finishing the job. Senator Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, the majority leader on the Senate floor. Also talking about this funding agreement, the minority leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky. This week, the Senate faces one more test to complete its annual appropriations process. And the stakes really couldn't be higher for American security at home and abroad. The work we have outstanding amounts to nearly 70 percent, 70 percent of the discretionary budget. Once again, I'm grateful to our colleagues on the Appropriations Committee for their commitment to regular order. 
I'm especially grateful to Senator Collins for fighting to advance Republican priorities throughout the process, particularly in the defense appropriations bill. Predictable annual allocations are essential to meeting national defense responsibilities. They allow for effective investments in modernizing our forces, developing new cutting edge capabilities, and expanding the industrial capacity that will drive long-term strategic competition. Needless to say, investments like these are especially critical right now as the gulf between the threats we face and the Biden administration's willingness to address them seems to be growing wider. Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, minority leader on the Senate floor, also talking about the agreement to finish up the final six fiscal year 2024 spending bills. The White House Press Secretary Crean Jean-Pierre during her news conference on Air Force One. Does the White House have a reaction to the spending deal that the congressional leaders reached? And is the White House satisfied with how that package approaches DHS funding in particular? So uh, we put out a statement this morning. Probably we're not able to see probably it from the president. Yeah. It's like, it's like, so this agreement on the six remaining funding bills, including DHS, uh, this agreement abides by the Fiscal Responsibility Act and provides the remaining agencies with funding through the rest of the fiscal year. The House and Senate Appropriations Committees are in the process of finalizing the text for Congress to review and pass as soon as possible to keep the government open and the President will sign it immediately. Congress must also pass the bipartisan national security supplemental. As you know, it passed overwhelmingly in the Senate. We want to see the, the we want to see the speaker put that on the floor. Uh, and as and this is and, and also the border sec, border agreement, which also came out of the Senate, uh, obviously wasn't passed uh, out of the Senate because of politics. Politics was put a, put put in the way of even moving forward with the border agreement. But to provide reforms and funding needed to secure the border, and so we want to see those two the border border agreement negotiations go through the process and we want to see the national security supplemental that was passed by 7029 out of the senate go to the floor of, uh, of the house so that we know we know for a fact that we would see overwhelming support uh, from the house we want to see that movement as soon as possible the white house press secretary Karine jean-pierre flying on air force one with the press corps and the president to reno nevada Senator Mike Lee, Republican of Utah, posting on X, an agreement has been reached within the firm. That doesn't mean the agreement will be acceptable to most members of Congress or to the American people. The fact that A, only the firm knows what's in this bill, B, the firm still won't tell anyone what's in it, but C, the firm nonetheless expects Congress to pass this still secret bill by Friday is an insult to the American people. We have reasons to be concerned that this bill will perpetuate a multi-trillion dollar deficit, be laden with corrupting earmarks, and fail to force Biden to secure the border. That was the post from Senator Mike Lee, Republican from Utah. He came up with that term, the firm, last fall, referencing the bipartisan leaders of the Senate and the House. At the time, he called them the law firm of Schumer, McConnell, McCarthy, and Jeffries, when Kevin McCarthy was Speaker. Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, who was temporary House Speaker until Mike Johnson was elected last fall, was asked today by Punchbowl News founder Jake Sherman about the timing of the spending deal votes. Department of Homeland Security was the last piece of the equation, a very charged topic, to say the least. Um, Deal came out or deal was reached last night. We haven't seen text yet. Probably come out tomorrow, which would put a vote probably on Saturday. Do you think... Johnson could collapse that 72-hour window that he needs? That it's he, not worth it. Yeah, probably not. Uh, the juice is not worth the squeeze here. Agreed. Uh, you could do a, a, you know, a, a two-, three-day CR that should or be not, able to clear. Or not, right? Or not. It's a Saturday. Right. Uh, and right here in Washington, I don't see a lot of these buildings full on a Friday. So, <laughs> or on know, a Thursday for the um, matter. <laughs> so it's not going to interrupt pay, and the OMB has wide authority. So... I think I think the speaker landing the deal is huge. I think you'll have a, a nice large vote like we did on the FRA, like we've had on the CRs and now the first legislative package in this this legislative package. So I don't think it's worth it. Um, and I think the 72 hour rule, we've got folks that don't support the deal, but really think that it's, it's an important ingredient. And it's much more important when your back's against the wall. 
Senate has to go through this process and their rules. And now in the House, I think we have to stick with those rules. Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, the Financial Services Committee chair at a Punchbowl News discussion today was mostly on a different subject, digital payment systems. But moderator Jake Sherman asking about today's headlines. Government Executive Magazine has a story. The federal agencies facing a shutdown threat later this week would send home more than 600,000 employees if Congress fails to enact funding by Friday, furloughing them with only the promise of back pay. An additional 780,000 workers would remain on the job, either because they are funded through mechanisms other than annual appropriations or their jobs are deemed necessary to protect life and property. The last piece of the spending agreement to come together was the Department of Homeland Security. And today, the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was at Axios's What's Next Summit in Washington. We um, have a solution at our fingertips. Does it cure all of the challenges? Of course not. But a bipartisan group of senators um, uh, reached a very significant compromise that it would advance for the first time in decades uh, our work in addressing irregular migration that reaches our borders in a way that um, we haven't since 1996. It would resource our department. We are a perennially um, financially starved department. Well, I hear you just got a couple months of uh, funding, so you don't have to close the doors. I, it, it, is, it is no cause for celebration. Uh, it is a cause for a sigh of relief that we make it for another day. But we are terribly, terribly underfunded. The, I, I hope every, let, let me, this gets complicated, but I'm going to try to give a quick snapshot. When one applies for asylum uh, at our border, one must meet a initial screening threshold of credible fear. It's purposefully low, so the, the history is so that we do not errantly send someone back to their place of persecution. Approximately, it depends on demographics and like, but generally speaking, 75% of the people who claim credible fear meet that initial threshold. The ultimate merits determination is a higher bar, 20, 25% actually achieve that. That's quite a disparity. The time in between that initial screening and the ultimate merits determination is seven plus years. And, and so what happens? People are able to work. They get work authorization. Uh, many have US citizen children. Uh, they attend our places of worship, our schools, they integrate in communities. It becomes very difficult seven, eight, nine years later to go into the community, apprehend a family, and remove them. Um, it, it explains in part why we have over 11.5 million undocumented people in the United States. The legislation, the bipartisan legislation, would fund us to reduce that period of time, that's seven years, to as little as under 90 days. And what happens is an intending migrant's risk calculation, do I spend my life savings, do I place myself and my loved ones in the hands of smugglers, only to be returned to my home country within 90 days. The risk calculus changes. It changes the entire dynamic of irregular migration. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at the Axios What's Next Summit in Washington, D.C. Story from NBC News, the Supreme Court on Tuesday allowed Texas to enforce a contentious new law that gives local police the power to arrest migrants. The conservative majority court, with three liberal justices dissenting, rejected an emergency request made by the Biden administration, which said states have no authority to legislate on immigration, an issue the federal government has sole authority over. That means the law can go into effect while litigation continues in lower courts. It could still be blocked at a later date. That reporting from NBC News. This is Washington Today. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, writes CNN, emphasized Tuesday that the U.S. will not let Ukraine fail as Congress continues to delay critical funding for Ukraine aid. Speaking in Germany at the 20th meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group at Ramstein Air Base, Austin said Ukraine's military continues to degrade the Kremlin's capabilities. 
Ukraine won't back down and neither will the United States, said Austin, while seated next to the Ukrainian defense minister. So our message today is clear. The United States will not let Ukraine fail. The coalition will not let Ukraine fail and the free world will not let Ukraine fail. That reporting from CNN. Later, Secretary Austin held a joint news conference with General C.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A reporter asked the secretary about Ukraine and asked the general about Israel's war against Hamas. Our first question will come from Missy Ryan, Washington Post. Thank you very much. Uh, secretary Austin, um, nice to see you. First for you, how great is the risk of a, of a major Russian breakthrough given the shortages that Ukraine is now facing? And does that danger continue to grow if the U.S. supplemental is delayed further? And do you think, given the stakes that you laid out in the fight in Ukraine, do you think the United States has a responsibility to dip further into its own stockpiles if the supplemental doesn't pass? And then for you, General Brown, um, the White House has said that the United States and Israel, based on a U.S. request, are now discussing alternatives to a major ground operation in Rafah. What alternative options exist for achieving Israel's security goals in southern Gaza, including destroying the remaining Hamas battalions? without further threatening aid delivery and further endangering the, the uh, civilians who are sheltering there, could, could it achieve those goals with some combination of targeted raids and precision strikes? Thanks. Well, thanks, Missy. It's great to see you as well. Uh, regarding um, a potential Russian breakthrough, uh, what we've seen on the battlefield is a series of incremental gains by, uh, by the Russians. To the point that the chairman made a couple of minutes ago, uh, these gains have come at uh, significant cost uh, in terms of personnel and equipment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we have seen uh, some incremental gains. And as I have engaged my, uh, my counterparts and, uh, and the chief of defense uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, they feel confident in their ability to continue to uh, defend their sovereign territory and, uh, and hold the line. Of course, uh, they need munitions, they need, uh, they need support in order to be able to continue to do that. And, and of course, uh, that's where the supplemental comes in. And we, we certainly uh, would hope that uh, we would see the supplemental get passed uh, uh, soon. Uh, you know, I continue to see broad support in both chambers of con uh, Congress uh, for, the, for Ukraine. And so uh, I'm optimistic that we will see uh, some action uh, moving forward. But, uh, but again, uh, this, uh, this is a thing that you can't absolutely predict, and we'll continue to work closely with Congress and our international partners to ensure that uh, Ukraine receives the support it needs. The thing I would like to highlight, uh, Missy, is that the United States is not doing this alone. Um, as you witnessed today, again, some 50 countries uh, <clears throat> gathered for the 20th time uh, to, uh, to uh, address security assistance for Ukraine. And in that, in that meeting, I continued to hear uh, unity and resolve uh, and an effort to find a way to continue to provide that support. So we're seeing allies and partners step up. But the, uh, the support from the United States of America, of course, is very, very important. Uh, thanks, Missy, for the uh, question. Uh, having not seen the uh, detailed plans that uh, the Israelis uh, might have for Rafah, it, it's hard for me to, to, to lay out a, an alternative. Um, and even so, I wouldn't provide you uh, specifics in this form, naturally. Uh, but uh, one of the things, that, if, as I've engaged with my counterpart, is we've engaged with the Israelis uh, throughout, uh, even uh, shortly after 7 October. Uh, we've had experience in uh, operating in, uh, in uh, urban environments in the Middle East. Uh, we continue to talk about uh, how we, the lessons learned that we have without telling, dictating to uh, the Israelis on, on how to execute. Uh, at the same time, we, we also talk to them about the, uh, how do we protect civilians. And I can say from personal experience, having uh, led the, uh, parts of the uh, air campaign in the defeat ISIS effort, uh, our focus on how do you protect civilians and minimize any type of collateral damage is a continued conversation. And that'll be an aspect of the conversation uh, that we will have with the, as I, we continue to have with the Israelis as they uh, uh, ponder future operations. General Charles C.Q. Brown, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a news conference at the end of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. 
about Ukraine aid. This from The Hill. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina, said Tuesday the U.S. should fund Ukraine aid via interest-free loans, opening the door to Republican support to assist the country's defense against Russian invasion. Graham visited Ukraine Monday to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Also on aid to Ukraine, the Pentagon's Office of the Inspector General today launching a new website with information about U.S. weapons and equipment provided to Ukraine. It's ukraineoversight.gov, and it notes that at the end of the calendar year 2023, the U.S. Congress had appropriated $113.4 billion for the U.S. response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Concerning Israel, Hamas, and Gaza, this is from Reuters. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spurned a plea from Joe Biden to call off a planned ground assault on Rafah, the last refuge in Gaza for more than a million displaced people, where Israel believes Hamas fighters are holed up. Netanyahu told lawmakers on Tuesday he had made it supremely clear to the U.S. president that we are determined to complete the elimination of these battalions in Rafah, and there's no way to do that except by going in on the ground. The story from Politico, two retired U.S. generals criticized the 2021 U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan as they diverged from President Joe Biden's position on the military exit. Retired General Kenneth Frank McKenzie, former commander of U.S. Central Command, and retired General Mark Milley, former Joint Chiefs Chair, said the exit from Afghanistan in August 2021 came up short, even as the country prepared to enter its second full decade in the conflict. Here is some of the hearing we covered before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the vice chair, Congresswoman Ann Wagner, Republican from Missouri, questioning the witnesses. The administration ignored the advice of allies, experts, and military leaders, blowing past warning sign after warning sign as it allowed Afghanistan to collapse. The total betrayal of our U.S. military servicemen and women, of our allies um, of Afghanistan, and the subsequent chaotic, shameful withdrawal has seriously damaged our credibility uh, as an ally and a leader. And because of the Biden administration's actions, American communities are less safe, and the world is much more dangerous and unstable. We are paying the price now with conflicts roiling every corner of the globe. And yes, General Milley, those responsible must provide answers, um, as you've said over and over, but also they must be held to account. General Milley, General McKenzie, I ask the following questions, not just as a member of Congress, but also as a mother of an Army Ranger who served uh, under your command in combat in Afghanistan. So let me ask both of you, General Milley, General McKenzie, did you engage with our NATO allies and other allied nations about the withdrawal plan before President Biden announced his decision to go to zero in April 2021? Absolutely, sure. That was fundamental. And then the NATO slogan at the time was in together, out together. So we coordinated multiple times with our NATO allies. Did our, did our allies with troops in Afghanistan recommend not going to zero prior to or after President Biden's April 2021 withdrawal announcement? John McKenzie? Yes, they did. And it was my actual belief that had we stayed at 2,500, we would have had probably 5,000 Yours NATO and everyone forces. else's. It may be more, maybe more than that. Including the Trump administration. Did our allies with troops in Afghanistan inform you that they would withdraw if the U.S. went to zero? General Milley? Yes, they, they said, uh, we'll be aligned with you, in together, out together, we'll be aligned with you, and, and that they would follow our lead. General McKenzie? Yes, because of the unique capabilities that the United States brings, they couldn't have stayed without our presence. General Milley and General McKenzie, with the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan was nearly uh, complete by mid-July, more than a month ahead of the August deadline. Why was the drawdown ex uh, executed so quickly? And did you at any point believe the process was moving too fast? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So it was by design. From the very beginning, 
we wanted to get out as quickly as we could because we believe speed brought safety and it would also give us a cushion in case unanticipated problems and what objectives arose. threat assessments or orders were driving the speed uh, concerns about the Taliban attacking us concerns about Isis being able to carry out attacks and but also a desire to have room at the back end in case we had trouble, we had weather problems, we had aircraft problems that, that slowed us down in, in, in case that did not happen. It's, not, was, it's not clear, sir, that the Afghan military and some of our allies, for that matter, were not ready for how quickly the U.S. Uh, withdrawal occurred. Did you ever consider or advise that the pace of the drawdown slowed to ensure the Afghan military was able to successfully transition? Um, if so, why was such action not taken? So the Afghan military was read in from the beginning about the pace of the withdrawal. And frankly, ma'am, I don't believe that waiting another 30 days would have had any material impact at all. One, on the one Afghan quick other question, ability. and I thank you so much. General Milley, General McKenzie, has the Taliban been carrying out a campaign of retribution? reprisals and revenge killings against the Afghan allies that we left behind? I believe yes. Absolutely. Systematically. Systematically. Congresswoman Ann Wagner, Republican from Missouri, vice chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, questioning retired General Frank McKenzie, former CENTCOM commander, and Mark Milley, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Democrat from New York, is the committee's ranking member. He asked Mark Milley if it's appropriate to look at U.S. involvement in Afghanistan over the last 20 years to find clues to the reasons for and the lessons from the problematic withdrawal of 2021. When the United States committed to the Doha deal, that was to withdraw, and I quote, withdraw from Afghanistan all military forces of the United States its allies, coalition partners, including all non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors, and supporting service personnel. Is that correct? That was the Doha deal done under the Trump administration. Is that correct? As I recall, I think there was seven conditions that the United States signed up to and eight conditions that the Taliban signed up to. And I think you rattled off most of the key ones. It was a very explicit thing. It said you had to go from the, the there were 13,000 more or less, 13,000 U.S. troops uh, when Doha was signed, and then it was you had to go to 8,600 in 135 days. Let, let, let me just do this. I want to make idea. sure. And so therefore, the withdrawal was well underway in January 2021 after President Trump withdrew U.S. forces, notwithstanding concerns about the Taliban's behavior. Is that correct? The withdrawal was absolutely underway. The drawdown of forces was underway, that's correct. So I don't have time, but I would like, you know, because I would like to do a complete investigation. That is what I think that our committee is, has the responsibility so that we can really be transparent with the American people on everything that took place in the 20 years in Afghanistan. Not just one piece, mm -hmm. but everything. If we are serious and not playing politics with this issue. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Democrat from New York, ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee at today's hearing with, you heard the answer from retired General Mark Milley, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, also there, retired General Frank McKenzie, former commander of U.S. Central Command. You can find the video of the full hearing at C-SPAN's website and archive, cspan.org. The Dayton Beach News Journal reports that Congressman Corey Mills, Republican of Florida, says he has helped 23 Americans exit Port-au-Prince, Haiti, which has fallen into chaos as criminal gangs have overpowered government forces. Our team has now successfully rescued and evacuated more Americans than President Joe Biden and his entire administration, he claimed in a tweet on X. And he went on, Americans deserve support from their government, not the pattern of abandonment this administration has shown. And that was reporting from the Dayton Beach News Journal in Florida. Today in Washington, the State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel asked about the situation in Haiti and Americans there. Republican of Florida Corey Mills um, saying today that he, his office has evacuated 23 Americans out of the capital in Haiti. Wondering if that is something that was coordinated with the State Department, if it's uh, an action that you support so uh, so look um we uh, are relieved when any american citizen is able to make its way uh to safety uh we of course 
closely coordinate with Congress on a number of issues, but uh, I will just note that um, uh, operations like these that um, uh, are sort of done deviating from formal State Department operations, um, they can be uh, high risk. Um, we're talking about a country that's been a, a level four do not travel country since 2020. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, we are not, th that, th that actions that are taken are not further inciting additional risk or putting uh, individuals into harm's way. But again, um, we're, we find it welcome news when any American citizen um, it makes its way to safety. I will just note from the State Department's perspective, um, you're aware of the um, uh, operation that was conducted over the weekend that was uh, able to facilitate the safe departure of over 30 U.S. citizens. Uh, we continue to uh, explore options that uh, we have at our disposal when it comes to American citizens uh, interested in departing Haiti um, from uh, specifically the Port-au-Prince area, and we'll remain in touch with um, uh, American citizens who have been expressed an interest in staying in touch with the embassy and learning about options through not just our crisis intake form, but Smart Traveler and the other mechanisms we have at our disposal. Yesterday, um, you would said that nearly a thousand people have registered through the portal, the website. Um, any update on those numbers or Americans? Uh, generally in Haiti? So that, so for, let me say two things. First, um, when we talk about uh, individual of the population of people who register, we have to remember we're not everyone who registers with this form or contacts us necessarily is requesting departure assistance. Some just want to um, stay in touch with the embassy. Some just want to see what information we have to share with them, uh, advice on how they may be able to re remain safely and to potentially stay in touch if they choose to potentially depart in the future. Um, like in any country around the world, we do not ask American citizens to register uh, with the U.S. government when they travel abroad. So numbers of how many American citizens are in um, X amount of country is always, uh, uh, they always vary and they're constantly changing, but the embassy uses uh, uh, estimates from smart traveler enrollments and from other uh, measures to have a rough number to work with. I will note that in terms of our our uh, crisis intake form, the number continues to be uh, approaching 1,000, and we'll continue to remain in touch with those uh, American citizens to answer any questions that they might have. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel at his news conference in Washington. A headline from Associated Press, Haiti Transitional Presidential Council takes shape as gang violence engulfs the Caribbean nation. And the subhead on the article, Caribbean leaders say all groups and political parties except one have submitted nominees for a transitional presidential council charged with selecting an interim prime minister for Haiti. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, this is Shannon Rice from C-SPAN Radio. Today, March 19th, marks 45 years since C-SPAN transformed your connection to government, delivering the House of Representatives straight into America's living rooms. You no longer needed to be in D.C. Wherever you lived, C-SPAN brought you into the halls of Congress, the White House, the courts, and on the campaign trail a mission that continues 45 years later on TV, online, on radio, and on our mobile app, as well as contacts through newsletters, social media, and podcasts. Today we celebrate C-SPAN's inaugural Founders Day in honor of the visionary founders who believed in offering unfiltered access to the inner workings of American democracy. It was a big idea back then, and it's just as important today. Help us celebrate C-SPAN Founders Day with a donation in honor of the original vision of C-SPAN's founders. Make your donation today at cspan.org slash donate. Extend our founder's vision by visiting cspan.org slash donate today to make your gift of support. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. It's free or wherever you find your podcasts. Peter Navarro writes New York Times, a trade advisor to former President Donald J. Trump, reported a federal prison in Miami on Tuesday, becoming the first senior Trump administration official to serve time over his role in the effort to subvert the results of the 2020 election. Mr. Navarro, 74 years old, who helped engineer Mr. Trump's plans to stay in power after his electoral defeat in November 2020, was sentenced to four months in prison in January for contempt of Congress after defying a subpoena from the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot. At a hastily organized news conference shortly before he was set to check into the Federal Correctional Institution in Miami, a low-security prison next to the Miami-Dade Zoo, 
Mr. Navarro reprised familiar denunciations of the Justice Department and the Biden administration, speaking in the parking lot of a commercial plaza flanked by a pizza store and a pawn shop. He cast blame on the federal trial judge in his case, as well as Mr. Biden and a long list of politicians he said were motivated by hostility toward Mr. Trump. That was from the New York Times. Here's Peter Navarro. They can put me in prison. They can put you in prison. Make no mistake about that. And make no mistake about this. They are coming after Donald Trump with the same tactics, tools, and strategies they used to put me over there today. Okay? Think about this. Stripped of all defenses before a jury trial. That's going to happen to him. Democrats in all the jurisdictions he's in. Fannie Willis in Atlanta. The guy uh, in, in, in Manhattan, uh, Bragg, it, and then of course Jack Smith at the Department um, of, of Injustice, as we like to call it on my side of the fence. So um, I'm pissed. That's what I'm feeling right now. But I'm also afraid of only one thing. I'm afraid for this country because this, what they're doing, should have a chilling effect on every American, regardless of their party. If they come for me, they can come for you. Peter Navarro across the street from the federal prison in Miami holding a news conference before he turned himself in. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, ruled on Monday that Peter Navarro must start serving the four-month sentence for contempt of Congress while he pursues an appeal. From Associated Press, President Joe Biden embarked Tuesday on a three-day campaign swing in the Sun Belt geared largely towards courting the Latino voters who helped power his coalition in 2020. His trip, which includes stops in Nevada, Arizona, and Texas, coincides with the formal launch of Latinos con Biden-Harris. Campaign ads ran in English, Spanish, and also Spanglish, and so did two Spanish-language radio interviews with the president. That was from Associated Press. The president stopped by his campaign office opening in Reno. Last week, Donald Trump uh, and I clinched the nominations. Mm -hmm. We're going to beat him again. We not only have this office, we opened up four offices so far in the state. Four, and there are going to be more. And folks, you know, we're going to keep making the case for second term by lowering the cost and creating more jobs. You know, we, uh, we have grassroots support. You know, so far this campaign, we've re- had more than 1,300,000 people have contributed under $200 to us. 1,300,000. And 500,000 of those people are brand new from before. And, so, and folks, you know, uh, the fact is that uh, the support around the country is real. I mean, it's not just, and it's not just for me, it's for Kamala, it's for the Democratic Party. And third thing is, uh, you know, we're, we've already created tens of thousands of good paying jobs right here in this state as well, by the way. Clean jobs, jobs, of, clean energy jobs. Trump lost millions of jobs, millions when he was president. Uh, it's amazing how the nostalgia for a lost four years was. President Biden at the Biden-Harris re-election campaign office opening in Reno, Nevada. Wall Street today, the Dow up 320, Nasdaq up 63, S&P up 29. Epic Electronic Privacy Information Center wrote about a bill that passed out of House committee a few weeks ago and is being debated on the House floor today. It's titled Protecting Americans' Data from Foreign Adversaries Act of 2024 saying it prohibits data brokers from selling, transferring, or providing access to American sensitive data to certain foreign adversaries or entities controlled by foreign adversaries. Under the bill, sensitive data includes identifiers such as social security number, geolocation data, data about minors, biometric information, and private communications. Here is Congresswoman Kathy McMorris-Rogers, Republican from Washington State, on the House floor. Data brokers are harvesting people's sensitive data and selling or sharing it without people's knowledge or consent. To make matters worse, they often do this without any safeguards against this sensitive information going to foreign adversaries who could easily exploit it for nefarious purposes. This sensitive information includes everything from a person's physical and mental health 
to their geolocation data. Oftentimes, it's sold to the highest bidder, including to foreign adversaries like China and the companies they control. H.R. 7520 will limit how data brokers are able to share Americans' personally identifiable and sensitive information abroad. I commend my energy and commerce colleague, Ranking Member Pallone, for his leadership on this legislation. It is an important complement to our ongoing efforts to establish a comprehensive data privacy standard, one that cracks down on abuses of Americans' personal information by narrowing the information that's collected in the first place and putting people back in control of their personal information. Today is an opportunity to send a very clear message that the U.S. will not tolerate the continued targeting, surveilling, and exploitation of Americans' data. This bill advanced out of our committee with unanimous, bipartisan, 50-0 vote, and I look forward to it passing the House this week. Congresswoman Kathy McMorris-Rogers, Republican from Washington State, chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee. She referred to Frank Pallone of New Jersey, who is the ranking Democrat on the committee and also spoke today on the floor. National security experts are sounding the alarm, warning that the government of Beijing and China and other foreign adversaries are amassing troves of sensitive data about individual Americans. And that information can be used to launch sophisticated influence campaigns, conduct espionage, undermine Americans' privacy expectations, and otherwise impair American interests. Just last week, this chamber took decisive bipartisan action to mitigate the national security and privacy threat that was posed by foreign-owned or controlled social media applications, collecting Americans' information by passing H.R. 7521, the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act. And today we take further action to close the pipeline of American sensitive information flowing to our foreign adversaries. Congressman Frank Pallone, Democrat from New Jersey, on the House floor. This bill is being brought up under the procedure known as suspension of the rules using the special debate rules and vote rules. No amendments allowed, shorter time to debate, and a two-thirds vote needed in order to pass it. Today is C-SPAN's 45th anniversary. We spoke with C-SPAN co-CEO Susan Swain about the company's mission, legacy, and future. Susan Swain, C-SPAN's co-CEO. We are marking 45 years this year. Why is this significant? Well, media institutions have no guarantee, do they? We've seen a lot of them go under in the past decade or so. And I guess if C-SPAN is still around at 45, the good news of that is that we're providing a service that some people find valuable. And I, I think what we've tried to do over the last decades is to build an institution that people can trust that they're gonna see the whole story, uh, and that uh, we have uh, the interest of showing the political process as it occurs without bias, without our own interpretation, and creating an archive where people can go back and find what uh, what public officials have had to say and decide for themselves what they think about it. That's what C-SPAN has been all about. And it, the fact that we're still around at age 45 means that uh, people have understood the role it plays and the niche that it has in American media. Let's go back to the beginning and remind our viewers how we started. Well, on March 19th, 1979, the gavel came down in the House of Representatives and Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, gaveled in the first ever televised session of the House. The hour to which the House arrived, adjourned having arrived, the House will be in order. Prayer be offered by the Reverend Chaplain. General stands approved. Gentleman from Tennessee. Set to address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker. No objection. Mr. Speaker, on this historic day, the House of Representatives opens its proceedings for the first time to televised coverage. I wish to congratulate you for your courage in making this possible, and the committee who has worked so hard under the leadership of Congressman Charles Rose to make this a reality. Television will change this institution, Mr. Speaker, just as it has changed the executive branch, but the good will far outweigh the bad. For about two years beforehand, private entrepreneurs in the cable industry had been organizing for that day. They built the first satellite uplink in the whole Washington, D.C. area to transmit that first televised session of the House to the American public. 18 million American homes who had cable television or satellite TV could see that first 
session of Congress. And it, it, it started a revolution, really, of televised access to the political process. Lots of people are now offering ways for people to follow Washington, follow Congress, follow the White House. But in 1979, this was a re real use of technology for the public good. And there had been nothing like it before. This year, for the first time for our anniversary, we're celebrating it by calling it a Founders Day. Why is that? What does that mean? Well, the reality of, of any media organization today, anyone watching this knows that their own media consumption habits have changed dramatically and that uh, the, the standard of 100 million homes having cable television wired in that they're paying a monthly subscription fee has changed enormously. Over the past seven, eight years, we've lost about uh, Forty percent of the homes uh, that carried cable and carried our signal to them. Along with that comes a loss of revenue. And so we've done everything we can to shore ourselves up in the face of change. But the reality is that there are lots of people who are accessing our content now who don't really help contribute to us producing it. And it's an expensive thing to do. So what we're doing is marking Founders Day and kicking off a campaign to ask the public for their help in continuing to support C-SPAN. We're still going to have our important base of cable and, and uh, uh, satellite companies who are carrying our signal. They pay 75 cents a year to carry C-SPAN in subscription fees, six and a quarter cents a month. Uh, but we're asking people who are watching us on cable who would like to help the cause, or people who are using us online through YouTube or through social media, if they would like to help support C-SPAN so we can continue to offer gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Congress, our history program, our books programming, and all the educational materials we develop for the classroom, all of which is available for free uh, without uh, the support of this, the cable networks. So we really want now to ask people to help contribute. Founders Day is an interesting concept. I think of the founders as being the entrepreneurs who started C-SPAN and created the private enterprise of the Congress that said yes to, to televising its sessions and seven years later, the Senate also saying yes, uh, of the reporters who covered us when we were an unknown quantity and they weren't quite sure what to make of it, but also importantly of the viewers who watched. Over the years, the viewer support of this network has been critical. They call into the college shows that you host they uh, also uh, support us online by using our products. And in many cases, they've helped to get us on cable systems over the years when we were seeking to expand our coverage. Now we're calling on viewers to help us in a different way with a little bit of support on Founders Day to help us with a contribution that will sustain C-SPAN into the future. So with those business challenges and opportunities, what can our viewers expect of us in the future? Well, our goal is the mothership is gonna be C-SPAN, C-SPAN 2, C-SPAN 3, providing the linear service, but we wanna be everywhere that people are consuming public affairs content. And that requires resources. You know, if we're gonna be building apps, if we're gonna have fast channels, if we're gonna expand our social media presence, it takes people and it takes technical resources. We're gonna be there but we'll do it faster and better with the help of our viewers through Founders Day contribution. And that's what we're asking for today as we mark our 45th anniversary. Susan Swain, thank you. Thanks, Greta. Susan Swain is C-SPAN's co-CEO, interviewed by another C-SPAN host, Greta Brauner. And to donate, you can go to cspan.org slash donate. That's cspan.org slash donate. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.